just cry about how great you are. Hallelujah. Our vocabulary is not expansive enough, God, to give you the glory that you're due, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord today. Praise the Lord. Amen. You can be seated. We're going to give you a chance to be faithful in your tithes and offerings today. Just a minute, we're going to give you an opportunity for that. We wanted to say how very glad we are to have all, everybody here today, and especially our guests today. We're excited to have Jen Schaefer with us here today. Amen. God bless her. Everybody else that's here, why don't you give yourself a hand clap and say, I made it. I made it. Good to see my friend Wayne here. Wayne, good to see you, man. Amen. Wonderful thing. Now, I, looks like we've got another guest. I think I missed the, I missed the, I forgot a name, forgive me. Jen, yes, Jen, good to see you again. God bless her. God bless her. Amen. Brother Tom, Brother Barry can help me out this time. Ready? You can go ahead and bring it up this time. could all get behind the words that are spoken, the words that are sung, and we can just make those words our words, and we can just worship the Lord together, and let those feelings, and we can identify with them, and worship the Lord with those feelings that are being expressed through song. I know there's all kinds of other songs that you might hear that would create a sense of nostalgia, a sense of remembrance of a time or a place. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You have a song that can take you back, or or a song that you can identify, man, I feel that way right now. But I think we ought to have that with some of the songs of God. Amen. We ought to have some of those on godly songs that we identify and say, that's how I feel right now. That's how I feel. So let's just worship with Sister Giselle as she sings. Amen. Thank you. 
teachers are there, then we will ask our children to walk to their teachers, all the children, the Bicoda and preteen class that they'd like to walk. All right. Amen. I'm thankful for Brother Andre. He's Done doing a great job as our outreach director. He uh, he's on fire for outreach. He's on. He's got a passion for the lost, and he's got a passion for God. And I really admire that. And I'm so thankful that he's going to speak to us today. Amen. And I just ask that we get behind uh, the Word of God, get behind Brother Andre, and and let let the Word minister to us today. Amen. And let's let's take the Word and digest it and make it a part of who we are. Amen. Brother Andre, come speak to us today, brother. Thank you, brother. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, such wonderful worship. We are so blessed to have the worship team that we have. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Oh, I thank Pastor and Brother Brandon for the opportunity to minister tonight. I'm going to try to teach and preach, and hopefully... It'll all be for the better. Amen? Amen? Praise God. I sometimes get in trouble when I mix the two, so I'm just going to try to let the Holy Spirit have his way. Amen? Praise God. You know, uh, start off right away, Romans 12, 1 through 3 is, is preached a lot in our circles um, because we understand there's more to our relationship with God than just believing that he existed, that he exists, that he died on the cross. There's more. There's a life 
there's a relationship. But until this point recently, I hadn't noticed something that was so glaring that I thought I'd share it tonight. So if we can get into this, Romans 12, 1 through 2, if you'd like to stand for the word of God. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service, also reasonable service, depending on your, your translation. Notice there, why is it our living sacrifice? Why is it our acceptable service? Because of the mercies of God. To go on to Romans 12, 2, it says, And be not fashioned according to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Verse 3, For I say, through the grace that was given me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think as to think soberly, according to... And here's the key. According as God has dealt to each man a measure of faith. Faith is the only thing we have to receive everything of God. All the grace, all the power, all mercies, everything God has for us is by our faith. He has filled the world with his power, but we can only receive it by the measure of faith. Getting a little background, little feedback. I don't know if you guys can hear it. Only by the faith can we receive it. And so tonight, I want to share what I believe is the most important topic that can be preached. I want to share what I think is the key to living the life of victory. Now, I'm not going to preach on the cross on grace, I'm not even preaching on faith. You say, well, how can you do that and say this is the most important topic? Test me. See if you think it is. When I got into this, I, I was doing some deep prayer, and this came to me, and I could not imagine, I couldn't believe I had not found this before this point. It is the foundation of faith. It determines how much you receive of God. You see, Pastor Brandon and other ministers can preach their heart out. They can bring the word fervently. Angels and ministering spirits can float around healing people. But it doesn't matter if you don't have the faith to receive it. So tonight I'm going to talk about what is the seed of faith. Not faith as a seed. What is the foundation of faith? You see, we must die. We must die. Romans 12, 1. Because of the mercies of God, we present ourselves a living sacrifice. The key in the scripture is not the call to sacrifice. The key in the scripture is by the mercies of God. And with that, I'd ask you to lift your hands and pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I pray for revelation, understanding. Lord Jesus, I pray your spirit would sweep through this place. Melt every hard heart. Tear away every blinding, tear away every blinding veil, Lord Jesus. Help me, Lord, to speak your word. Help me to speak it in such a way that faith would grow. Help us, Lord Jesus, to receive everything you have for us here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Anyone curious yet? <laughs> faith is fueled by one thing our desire for Jesus not our desire to live for him that's different you see our desire to live for him obeying his word that is a product of our faith our faith is revealed in how we live for him no our desire for Jesus for the relationship, our desire to want to hug him, our desire to want to draw near to him, our desire to know him in the word, our desire to just be in his presence, our desire for Jesus is the seed of faith. You see, there's many scriptures that back this up. In the New Testament, it says God rewards us according to our works. 
Now, a lot of people don't like that because that means you've got to do something to live for God. But it's there. It's all over the place. Nowhere does it say we're judged according to our faith. Did you know that? It says we're judged according to our works because our works are produced by our faith. So there's no contradiction. You see, our works are produced by our righteousness, and our righteousness is determined by our faith. And our faith is determined by our heart's desire for God. That's why in some places it says God rewards us according to our works. He rewards us according to our righteousness. He rewards us according to our faith. He rewards us according to our heart. As a man thinketh, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he in his heart. You see, all those scriptures are true. It's not one or the other. They're all true. They're all linked. You see, there's two seeds of desire. There's this desire for heavenly treasures. There's a desire for the blessings. There's a desire for the better life. There's a desire for the things that are invisible. You see, that desire works on some of us. But if we'd be honest with ourselves, not for most of us. Because most of us still can only see what we can see. It takes a very disciplined person to be able to live for God for the expectation of heavenly treasures. But God doesn't leave us there. God gives us even a greater motivator. You see, the other desire, the seed of faith, is our realization of what Jesus has done for us. You see, by the mercies of God, we are to present ourselves a living sacrifice. By the mercies, because he's been merciful, because he's done so much for us, we owe him our lives. Now, I know this hasn't, hasn't really shaken much things. It hasn't like, been a huge revelation. But if you really hone in on this, you realize every single blessing from God comes by your desire for him. Not your desire for the things he can give you, your desire for him. And every single opportunity of the devil, every single sin, every single darkness that comes against you, can only come at you according to your heart's desire for it. This is why God said, love me with all your heart. It's always heart first. It's the subconscious mind. It's your being. It's who you are. Anyone ever known someone who knew what to do right, but they kept doing wrong, and they couldn't figure it out? There's people sitting in jail going, why did I do that? That was so dumb. Why did I do that? It's because the heart, the seeds of heart. You see, let me give you an example. Is this all right? If you expected the regular crazy, boisterous, uh, you know, shouting on, that he's not here tonight. Uh, this, this, this is so, this is, and I, I hope I deliver it in such a way you can catch it. But let me give you an example. A few months back, I was riding with Brother Rick up to, up to Nebraska. He was doing some work on a revival, needed someone to go with him. Sister Lori wasn't feeling good, so I went with him. And on the way up there, I get a phone call from my wife. And she sounds frantic, but okay. And now let me tell you what happened. She got the kids ready, was on her way to nursing home service to minister there. And as she was driving down the hilly roads of CC Highway, you know, 55 miles an hour is the speed limit, but there's some hills. You can't see what's coming over the hill. And as she was driving with all four of my babies in the car, over the hill comes a truck, 55, 60 miles an hour, and the guy's looking down. And she gets over on the side of the road as much, but if you've driven that highway, there's not much shoulder. And there's a lot of ravines. There's a lot of ditches. And she said it happened so fast all she had time to do was take her foot off the gas. And she said she just took her foot off the gas, and the guy, and she got over all the way, and the guy still was drifting right at her. She said she didn't even have the time to think. All she said in her mind was, Jesus! And instantly, the guy looked up, swerved out of the way, and just missed her. I mean, the, the, the lamps, the, the, the side mirrors almost hit. She was often that she said she was an instant away from just taking the car in the ditch because she figured the ditch would be a better choice than a head-on collision. Now, let me tell you, 
You know what I saw there? I saw the mercies of God. You see, from what I understand about the devil, the devil has no mercy. When the devil said, I can't even tempt Job because you got this hedge, Jesus says, okay, you can go ahead and test him, but you can't kill him. Now, why did, the, why did God have to tell Satan not to kill him? Satan didn't say, I'm going to kill him. He said, I'm going to test him. I'm going to tempt him. I'm going to see if I can get him to curse you. Why did God have to tell Satan, don't you kill him? Because it's the devil's nature to kill us. You see, every life the devil can take is one less life to serve God. And so every single moment that I see in my life where a life has been spared, that's the mercies of Jesus. That's not happenstance. That's not coincidence. That's not luck. That's Jesus. And I thank Jesus for saving my family because it could have been bad. The week before, there was a head-on collision on a two-way highway, and a whole family was wiped out. But it wasn't mine because Jesus, he had mercy for us. And when I hear something like that, when I think of something like that, I, I don't want to dance. I don't want to jump up and down. I just want to fall to my knees. And I want to thank him. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to hug him. I just want to follow him. I just want to do something for him because he's been so good to me. He's been so good to all of us. If he's done anything for you, would you lift your hand? Would you praise him right now for him? Thank you. Hallelujah, Jesus. You see, by his mercies, we are to be a living sacrifice. When we start realizing what he's done for us, I guarantee you everything you love in your life that is honorable is from God. My grandpa died 13 years ago. I had a wonderful relationship with him. When I found out he was in the hospital, I called up the college I was at to tell him I was going to miss some classes, and I went to tell him my grandpa's dying. And I, went, I, uh, I couldn't even talk. He was grandpa, you know? But even though he's no longer with us, I still thank Jesus for the opportunity I had with him because not everyone gets a grandpa like that. Not everyone gets to ride on the tractor down to the gas station and get, pick out some bubble gum. Not everyone gets to pop popcorn, throw as much butter and salt on as you want because mama's not looking, and sit on the front porch and just eat popcorn with grandpa. I praise God for the mercies in my life. I praise God for the things he's given me of value. And this is the seed. This is what will help you grow your faith. Because the Bible says, as you draw near to him, he draws near to you. And the measure of faith that he pours out in you will be related to your desire for him. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7. It says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. You see, the mercies of God are that his glory would shine through us because he has mercy for us. He has life for us. He has love for us. He wants us to choose him instead of death, instead of the devil, instead of the works of Satan. He wants to draw us to him. He wants us to seek him because when we seek him, we shall find and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Amen? You see, we talk about faith. We give a lot of lip service to faith. All the churches do because faith's important. But what is the seed? Why is it people get healed and some don't? Well, there's a lot of answers to that. But why do some people get a revelation and other people don't? Why is it that pastor can preach a message and people, half the people get the Holy Ghost? Just presence, just sit on them. And other people are like, what? What's the big deal? 
It's because the measure of faith. The measure of faith. Your faith is a direct relation to your seeking Jesus. We are so blessed in this country. We are so mightily rich. I don't care if you're going down to the soup kitchen getting food. You're still richer than 95% of this world. I have lived rich, and I have learned, lived broke on food stamps. And I wouldn't trade it for some of the kings in Africa how they live. We are so blessed. And the problem with that is we get comfortable. We get apathetic. The problem with that is we quit realizing we need him. You see, when you don't know when your next meal's coming, if you don't know when you send your kid out to go hunt something for dinner, if he's coming back, that'll cause you to fall on your knees. That'll cause you to seek the only protection you've got. That'll cause your heart to seek Jesus because he is the only answer. And if we can get a hold of that, if we can seek Jesus, not the miracles, not the healings, not all these things he does, for, but seek him. If we can come after Jesus and say, Lord, I want you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I bow down before you. Lord, come dwell with me. Then he will. He will. And more of his glory will be in your life. Your faith will rise and your life will be more full of joy, more full of love, and more full of peace. See, it's still about Jesus. It's still about Jesus. If we get this right, everything else falls in place. You don't have to be raised in a Christian church to find God. You don't have to be raised with parents who are preachers to find God. You see, nothing separates us from the love of God because he's only one desire of the heart away from being right there with you. You see, it is the desire of the heart that we need for God. It is the desire. Hallelujah. I don't have a long message tonight. Got a lot of testimonies, but not a long message. You see, I was in my car driving. I do that a lot with my job. And I was just thinking, what's the most important thing I can pray for? And I pray the tabernacle plan, as many of you know. And I just stopped and said, Jesus, teach me to love you more. Teach me, Lord Jesus. Because there's only two things. There's loving God and loving others through God. And you can't love others the way we should if you don't first love God. So I was saying, Lord, teach me how to love you more. Teach me how to pray. Teach me how to fast, how to praise you. But Lord, help me to love you more. And instantly, all of these memories of what God had done for me start coming to my mind. Now, I don't know what your earliest childhood memory is, but mine is at 18 months old. I know that because my parents told me how old I was. I remember being in a dark place with a bright light. And I just remember feeling like I was being squeezed, like I was turned on my side and just being squeezed, and it was just agony. I just remember the agony, like there's so much tension. And all of a sudden, this silhouette of someone leaned over me. And all I know is I felt peace. And all I know is instantly, I felt love, and I just went, oh, and I just relaxed and then went black. I thought first it was my mom. It wasn't her. Then I thought it was my dad, but I talked to him about it. He said, you had spinal meningitis at 18 months old. You and another boy at Heartland Hospital. They said if it was one type, you'd live with a certain chance. If it's one type, you're dead. And they said that every moment I was getting worse, every moment, until as they were in the hallway, some preacher walked by. And this preacher said, can I pray for him? I said, yeah. 
And he went in. And I don't know who it was, but he had the Holy Ghost. And he laid his hands on me. And God spared my life. God spared my life. I, I don't have to be here. The other child died. Or how about how God saved me from drowning? I was in Australia with my dad and my brother, and I heard that there was these things called riptides. I don't know what they were. I was 11 years old or so. And how they take you out to sea, and some kid had just died. And, of course, me having to test and prove everything, I thought, how could that be? The water comes in. So I asked, where's the riptide? The guy says, right over there. So I went swimming. And I was out there swimming like, this ain't no big deal. This ain't no big deal. I can still touch. But, you know, I'm a good swimmer. All of a sudden, I realized, I'm getting out. And even though they told me, you swim to the side, not back to shore, I panicked. And I started swimming with everything I had. I would go down, hit the sand, and lunge forward and swim, swim, swim. I wasn't going anywhere. But luckily, my brother, my brother was there. You know, he's seven years older than me. He was there. And he saw me. I called out, Aaron, Aaron. And he saw me, and he didn't realize how much trouble I was in. He thought, oh, no big deal. He'll come over. So he came over to grab me, and he first tried to push me forward, and he realized he was going out too. And so you know what he did? He went down underwater, had me put his feet on his hands, and he threw me forward. Not once, not twice, three times until we were able to swim back to shore. Now, look, I'm glad my brother helped me. I'm glad my brother was used and saved me, but I know that was Jesus having mercy on me. And I have to say, if you're over the age of 18, you can probably think of some times that the devil could have taken you out. But by some miracle, by some chance, by some mercy of Jesus, he saved your life too. I'm not the only one in this house God's had mercy on. I guarantee everyone in here who's over 18, 18 has had some chances, had some opportunities where the devil wanted to kill him. And God said, no, he's mine and had mercy on you. God also had mercy on my mom. My mom was saved from a barrel of a gun. I'm not going to get into the situation. But my mom is still here. Hallelujah, 15, 16 years later. You see, when I think of everything that Jesus has done, my love for him grows. My desire for him grows. When I think of the goodness of God and all he's done for me, I can't help but cry out. I can't help but tear up. I could barely drive. I wanted to pull over the side of the road because I just wanted to worship him. I just wanted to love on him. You see, when you think about all the mercies of God, it makes it easy to live for him. When you think what God has done, that everything good in your life is from his mercy, it makes it easy easy to be a living sacrifice for the creator for the master for Abba Father hallelujah 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 like I said I believe this is the most important topic that we can ever talk about. Loving Jesus, your heart's desire. Did you know that every single distant thing that causes you to fall away from God comes from a lack of desire for Jesus? It doesn't come from a lack of knowledge. We've seen people with a head full of knowledge, Bible quizzers, outreach directors. We've seen pe preachers who know the truth, who can quote it, fall. Fall. You see, the other side of the coin is when you take God for granted. When you take your salvation for granted. That's why the, the understanding, the thought of once saved, always saved is so dangerous. Because did you guys know that when Christian conferences come to town, that is the highest I don't know what you say, the highest rating or, or the highest viewed, viewing 
of pornographic materials in hotels. Christian conferences. You know why? Because there's no guilt. They got Jesus, right? Whenever you think that the blood of Jesus washes away every sin, whether you're repented or not, it gives you a license to sin. That's why Paul said, what, are we full of grace that sin should abound? God forbid! We've been made new creatures. That's why in Hebrews 10, 26, it says, after coming into the knowledge of Christ, if you continue to willfully sin, there remains no more sacrifice for sin because the blood of God is able to cover every sin that you repent of. You see, all the devil has to do is get you to take Jesus for granted. All, all the devil has to do is get you to start taking your salvation for granted. You see, you can love living the Christian life. You can love reading the Bible. You can love doing all this other stuff. But unless you have a love for the presence of Jesus, you are in danger waters. Dangerous waters. Because a life without passion for God, the devil will fill. We've seen... We've seen great men of God do tremendous works and then personally fall because they lost their first love. They lost their desire for that relationship for Jesus. Every bit of backsliding starts from taking your salvation for granted. Every single backsliding, becoming reprobate, getting to the point where you blasphemy the Holy Ghost, all starts from taking your salvation for granted. All starts from losing that fire, that desire for Jesus. Amen? It's so important. Because if you don't have a passion for Jesus, what do you have a passion for? And the devil will usually take you to a noble motive. Well, I'm doing it for my kids. Oh, I, I'm doing it for financial security. Oh, I'm doing it to write that bigger tithe check. And the devil slowly getting your heart into the cares of this world. Although they might be acceptable. It might be financial success. It may be getting your kid in every single extracurricular activity. It could be anything. But it doesn't want you to be loving on Jesus. This is the seed. It's how we have faith. It's how we fall. It is the foundation of everything. In closing, I don't know if Sister Lyle here, you can play. This is probably the most, I'm going to try to tell the story. In 2007, I was going to try to tell it without you knowing it was me, but there's no chance of that. 2007, we were doing pretty good financially. I went off on a builder's trip, you know, where they paid for everything, you know, the Lumber Yard was trying to get me to buy all their stuff, and so they took me on this nice fancy trip to Oregon, tour lumber mills, and, and you know, eat whatever I wanted, and, and all this kind of stuff. It was, you know, plane tickets just treating me real good. And when I landed back in the Colorado Springs airport, I was walking down, I was walking down that breezeway. I got a phone call from Giselle. And uh, a bit panicked, a bit nervous. She, you see, she was... Were you seven months pregnant? Eight months? Six or seven months pregnant with Titus. So our two girls were three and one, three and two, something like that. Well, she, being pregnant and being hot, she went over to a girlfriend's house where there's other moms. You know, she was part of La Leche and, and Mops, mothers of preschoolers. And she was over there, and it was air conditioned. It was cool, but it was cooler in the basement. So they saw the four kids in the backyard, all, all little kids. I think Julia might have been the oldest. And they said, well, everything's locked up. They had a swimming pool. But there was a lock on the gate, so it's safe. So all the ladies go downstairs where it's nice and 65 degrees. And she's just laying there hot, tired, and all of a sudden she has this thing, check on the kids. And she had no energy to do it. So she talked to another lady who just had twins. Is that right? And... She said, would you go check on the girls? And she said, if, if she would have said no, she would have just brushed it off. But the lady says, you know what? I'll go check on the kids. So she goes upstairs. 
opens the door, and she hears this gigantic scream. Just scream. The basement empties out. They run out in the backyard. Turns out that lock didn't actually lock the gate. The gate was latched over it. The girls wanted to swim. So they opened that gate up, walked up the path, walked to the edge of the pool. And they had already started to get ready like they're taking a bath. Taking off their clothes, were floating in the pool. And just before Julia was to jump in, that lady came out, screamed, and stopped her. And Giselle said, what were you doing? She says, I'm a big girl. I can swim. And all the other kids had got ready to swim, too. They were all just about to jump in. I don't care what you say. That is not luck. That is not happenstance. That is the mercy of God to save my family. Because she could have gone into labor that very moment if something happened to those girls. I was coming back living for the world. And God had mercy on me. Don't tell me the devil wasn't trying to kill my girls. The devil doesn't have a breath of mercy in him. Jesus saved my family. He probably saved my marriage. He saved everything I hold dear of this earth. By the mercies of God, I must live for him. By the mercies of Jesus, I will have a living sacrifice for him. He has done so much for me. He has done so much. And I guarantee if you think about it, he's done so much for you too. If you think back at your life, I guarantee you can think of moments. We can't take them for granted. This is God's power in our lives that we may seek him more, that he may pour into us more faith, the measure of faith, that we can have victory over those devils in our family, that our family can be set free by taking dominion, spiritual dominion over them. It's that we can have healing. We can have miracles. We can have our kids worshiping God, praying God. <laughs> It is the power by which we have faith, our desire to love Jesus. I say if God's ever done anything for you worth kneeling down before him, if God has ever saved something precious in your life, I invite you to this altar. If you can't make it, that's fine. Make an altar where you're at. But lift your hands. Fall down before him and worship him. Love him. Show appreciation. It is your ticket to greater faith. It is your desire for more of Jesus. It'll keep the devil away. It'll heal the backsliding. Thank you, Jesus, for having mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us even before we first loved you. Thank you, Jesus, for as we were in the thralls of this world, you had mercy for us we don't deserve it we can't earn it but Lord Jesus we can live for you as our reasonable as our spiritual service in Jesus name hallelujah 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 when I think about the Lord how he saved me how he raised me how he filled me with the Holy Ghost When I think about the love, how he picked me up, turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost. I think about the love How he picked me up Turned me around Placed my feet On solid ground Holy God. 
the glory, all of the honor, all of the praise. 